please pray with me. Father, thank you for the stories from your word. Lord, teach now that my brothers and sisters would know you at a deeper level, that we would all be surprised by an element of worship that I don't think we think about. And I pray, Father, that you would change hearts today. And Lord, if there's anyone here who is not 100% sure that they're going to heaven, that they would listen closely to what you say and that this morning they would make that decision to cross over to life eternal. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to know that the, every message I give you is from God's word. But this one was something that every once in a while God lays something on my heart. And then I start studying it and then things start changing and I realize, oh God, you were in my tomorrows. And you knew that we needed to hear this. And as I prepare it and I get closer, I realize this really was God that put this on my heart. I didn't make it up. The phone rang and I answered it a few years ago. And it was a family member, not mine. It was a family member of a friend. And the it's one of those phone calls you don't want to receive. And it was that my friend was in the hospital. I knew he was in the hospital, but he was dying. He had gone into the hospital the day before for a catheterization and a stent in his artery and his heart. And then while in the hospital that night, he suffered that whole night they did not discover until the next morning he was suffering a major heart attack in the hospital unbeknownst to them. And now so much of his heart was damaged, he wasn't gonna recover. As they got in the truck to drive over to the hospital, I thought, where is he mentally right now? You see, I realized that he walked into the front door of the hospital the day before and he found out he's going to be carried out the back door in the very near future. Is he in panic? Is he in pain? Is he in disbelief? Is he in denial? Where would you be if that happened to you? And what can I say? Can you tell someone like that? Oh, I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. Well, no, you can't. I didn't have to wait too long to find out where he was. I walked into the hospital room and I can still see him laying in bed. And he turned his head and he looked at me and he said, Pastor, today I learned I'm going home to Jesus. Could you say that? That soon? Was he delirious? Did he not understand what was going on? He understood. He knows something that I needed to learn and you may need to learn too something he knew and that's what I'm going to talk about today what do you do when you're facing the impossible where do you go when it's something that is way beyond what you can do what do you do we pray maybe we praise what do you do I want to take you to a story in the Bible that you may or may not be familiar with. It's in 2 Chronicles. I know this is probably part of your daily reading, so. Um, there are some wonderful stories. Open up your Bibles to 2 Chronicles. As you open up your Bible, you know you got the first five books of the Bible, and then you'll see that you have 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, slow down. 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. If you hit Psalms, you've gone too far. 
For those of you with my Bible, it's page 464. It's probably not going to help you, is it? I want you to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's going to take me a little while to get there because this is a wonderful story that gives us some wonderful insight on what you do when you are faced with impossible circumstances. When you're facing a giant you can't get over, you're facing a mountain that you can't get over, you can't get through, and you can't get around, what do you do? There's a caveat. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior, this sermon's not gonna do you any good. There are promises in the Bible that are given to us as people who have trusted alone in Christ alone. The rest, it's an invitation to trust God to enter into his promises. And so I wanna remind you all, do you know for sure where you're going if you were to die today? I hope you do. I know I do. And it sounds like pride when I say that. Oh, believe me, it's not pride. I understand what I deserve. I fully deserve hell. I've read enough of the Bible to know that I do. But I understand that Jesus Christ died for me and for you. And I trusted in him as my savior. And based on his word, based on his work, I know that I'm going to heaven, somebody who really doesn't deserve it. See, the Bible tells us for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's what God wants you to know. Then the wages of sin is death. Basically, what the Bible is saying is, y'all messed up and you're all going to hell. Now, if that's all I had, I would not be doing this. I'd be out making the best I could of this life because this is all there is, right? No, wrong. What I want you to know is the Bible says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, that's why he came. He laid his perfect life down to give you life. And the Bible goes on to say, this is what you need to do and what I need to do only once. And God knows if your heart is right. For it is by grace you are saved by faith. For it is by grace, free gift. You're getting something you don't deserve. Me too. You're saved by faith. Faith in what? Faith in faith? No. Trusting in Christ that he laid his life down for you. He paid the price for everything you've done wrong in your life. Past, present, and future. Everything. And he's offering you eternal life. And what he wants from you is to go to him and say, Lord, I understand I deserve hell. You died for me. And right now I'm trusting in you alone is the only way to heaven. Lord, save me. And he will. His word. This is my desperate plea and prayer for all of you that every person that walks into this room will know Jesus Christ as Savior. The peace that comes from that is incredible and lifelong. And so this is for those of you who have trusted Jesus. If today, this is the day that you trusted, I'd like to know that because I'd like to give you some materials that would help you grow and better understand what I just said. But right now, I want to introduce you to King Jehoshaphat. That's who the story's about today. The story that I want to cover is in 2 Chronicles 20, but it actually starts in 2 Chronicles 17. Jehoshaphat was a good king. To give you a little bit of a timeline, you know that David, uh, King Saul was the first king, and then King David. We all know about David, David and Goliath. David was the greatest king Israel ever had. He had a son, and that, he had many sons, but his son Solomon took over the kingdom. King Solomon died in the year 931 BC, 931 years before Jesus came. King Solomon was wealthy, but when he died, the nation split and not right down the middle. There was two of the original 11 down or 12 down in the south and then the others were all up north. And so you had Judah in the south and you had Israel up north. The northern region didn't have one good king. They were all evil. 
for years, for centuries. But the southern region, Judah, did have some good kings. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. What do I mean by good king? God called some of them good because they followed God. They did what he said to do. Jehoshaphat was one of those. He came in and, and he led the people well. He did many things that God wanted him to do. But even being a good king and being powerful and having the blessings of God with wealth and the country was doing great under his leadership, he still made mistakes. One of the key mistakes that he made was he allowed his son to marry the king of the north, Israel's king, Ahab, his daughter, which was a common thing to do. That's what royal families would do. They'd intermarry. Now they're connected, so they'll be at peace with each other. So that was a very common worldly thing to do, but not what God wanted at all. Let me tell you a little bit about King Ahab. King Ahab was the bloodiest king Israel ever had. Anybody here know what his wife's name was? Jezebel. I don't need to tell you much about her other than how many people do you know named their daughter Jezebel? <laughs> Probably the same amount of people that named their son Judas. Ahab and Jezebel were so wicked, so bloody, so evil that they would make Bonnie and Clyde look like Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. <laughs> they were awful. And yet, Jehoshaphat allowed his son to marry into that family. Now he's connected with evil, and it's going to have a great effect on him. King Ahab is a pretty smart guy, and he's more than smart, he's clever. King Ahab invites Jehoshaphat on up for a big old party. And so they're having this wonderful banquet party, and... Ahab tells Jehoshaphat, asks him, he said, hey, I want to get this region back, this Gibeon region back, and I'm going to need your help. Why don't you join up with me and we'll go to war together against them? And Jehoshaphat said, okay, sounds good to me. There's a mistake there. And the mistake is he didn't ask God. Ah, but he thought about it and he said, oh, wait a second, we need to ask God first. Got any prophets up here? You know, they're in Ahab's hometown. So Ahab brings in 400 prophets and the prophets all come in and they go, God has spoken to us, go, you're gonna have a great victory. This is gonna be wonderful. Jehoshaphat's no dummy. He looks at Ahab and he goes, these are your yes men. They're paid to tell you yes. Do you have any real prophets? And this part's kind of comical. Ahab looks at him and he goes, well, there's this one guy, Micaiah, but I hate him. He never says anything good about me. <laughs> Duh, maybe. God's not happy with you, Ahab. And so Jehoshaphat says, bring Micaiah in. I'm going to talk to him. So Micaiah comes in and Micaiah said, yeah, go ahead, go for it. And Ahab looks at him and said, are you lying to me? And Micaiah said, yeah. He said, actually, before Ahab and before Jehoshaphat, Micaiah said, I got a vision from God. And in that vision, I saw all y'all on a bloody field, dead. You too, Ahab. You think that might cause Ahab to say, whoa, wait a second, let's wait on this. Let's think about this. He looks over at Jehoshaphat and he goes, isn't that what I said? I hate this guy. He never has anything good to say about me. And then he puts Micaiah in jail. He said, put him in jail, give him bread and water. And Micaiah, spoken like a true prophet of God, as they're dragging him out, says, King, if God spoke to me, you ain't coming back, pal. You're dead meat. They go into battle. Ahab is no dummy. Ahab says, when we go into this battle, Jehoshaphat, I want you to wear your kingly robes, okay? Show everybody who you are. I'm gonna hide out so I can sneak around, okay? Who were all the other archers and guys looking for? The king. They enter into battle and they all turn and they run after Jehoshaphat. 
Jehoshaphat cries out and God miraculously saves him. They realize he's not the guy they want. Ahab gets off scot-free. Except, maybe in frustration, one of the archers from the other army, poof, lets an arrow fly. Just up into the air. You know where it landed? In a chink in the armor of Ahab. And kills him. You can hide. You can run. But you can't hide from God. It came true that day. He died. Now, why is that important to this story with Jehoshaphat? Have you ever had a word from God, you read it, or somebody told it to you, and you didn't follow it? And you look back and you say, if I just would have followed that godly advice, I wouldn't be in this mess today. Has that ever happened to you? Does that only happen to me? I'm not going to do that again. I think I learned my lesson. You know what's going to happen next? God's going to bring another trial just like that into your life to see if you really did learn your lesson. Have you noticed a pattern with that? Be on the lookout. You'll notice that he will do that. That brings us to 2 Chronicles 20. He is going to get his next shot at this. In 2 Chronicles 20, it reads this in verse 1. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the uh, Meunites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. So you have three nations that are co closing in on this little nation, Judah. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea out of Aram, and behold, they are in Hazan Tamar. Jehoshaphat was terrified. He's dead meat. So what's he going to do? Let me ask you, what would you do? He has just learned they are dead meat. Are you going to call up some other nations? Are you going to do what Ahab did and try to get other people to fight your battles with you? Are you going to start strategizing? Are you going to go to the war room and start working on this and see what you can do? Or maybe you're just going to turn and run. Jehoshaphat, verse 3, was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord. Some people never think about going to church when something like this happens. But he did. He turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Oh, that's great. Let everybody get nice and weak from their, uh, now they're not eating. So now they're going to get sick because they're not eating. Why would they do such a thing? They would call fasts because when you're fasting, you are separated unto God and you realize your total, elite, your total dependence is on him with each hunger pang in your stomach, but you're taking time to spend that time with God. And sometimes if you want something to happen in the physical world, you can't make it happen. You got to call on a spiritual world. And sometimes that requires fasting. We don't talk much about that, do we? So Judah, verse four, gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Now you have this huge movement of people in Judah all coming together for a prayer meeting. I'm going to take the time to read this prayer because this prayer is one that we should know. This is one that we could pray for our country today. We could pray this for ourselves. Listen to what he says. Jehoshaphat stands up before all of Israel or all of Judah and is starting in verse six. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? In other words, you're large and in charge, God. And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? 
power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? You gave us this land. They want to take it away. God, they're no match for you. They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name saying, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this house and before you. For your name is in this house and cry to you in our distress and you will hear and you will deliver us. A little ringing in your ears of Second Chronicles uh, 714. If my people were called by my name. Do you think he didn't know about this? He knew about it. Because Solomon was before him. Now, verse 10, behold, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. See how, look God, look what they're doing. They're rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. I wonder if we don't need more Christians marching forward on their knees today saying, Lord, you gave us this land. People are trying to take it away from us. You gave us these freedoms and you're trying to take, they're trying to take it away from us, God. Or maybe there's some personal things in your life. God, there is something in my life right now that's trying to take control. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's addiction to um, prescription drugs or pornography or, or something else. God, I, I need freedom. Oh, our God, verse 12. Will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. It's certain death for them. And I love the way he ends it. Do you see how he ends it? We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, God, but our eyes are on you. We're waiting for you to act. Have you ever been there? I have. So what do they do? Let me go over that prayer again real quick. Just give you a summary statements of what he did in that prayer. You may want to jot some of this down. He committed the situation to God, acknowledging only God could save them. Number two, he pleaded on the basis that they were God's people. Can we not do that today? Number three, he acknowledged God's sovereignty over the situation. God knows. He sees everything. Number four, he praised God's glory and took comfort in his promise. Quite frankly, that's the only place I get peace today is knowing that God sees and God knows. Number five, he professed complete dependence on God, not himself for deliverance. That's a pattern for us. It's a pattern for you. It's been a pattern for me and it's where I find peace. You see, When my problems seem so big, when God enters the picture, they get really small. I realize that many times when I'm complaining to God, I'm telling him how big my problem is. And then I sense God is telling me, stop talking to me and tell your problem how big your God is. Have you tried that? So what did he do? This is the strangest strategy of war I've ever seen. You won't see this uh, in, in Sun Tzu's book, Strategies of War. You won't see it there and you won't see it any place else. The strategy is he gathered the whole army and as they marched out of the city, he said, wait a second. And he got the choir and he got the band and he put them in front of the army. How would you like to be in that choir? (laughs) Now you're front line and the army's behind you and now you're in front of them and you're facing the enemy. And as they went out, they started to sing. And as they started to sing, you know what happened? The armies they were going out against turned against one another and they slaughtered one another. 
and Israel watched. They asked God to step in. They stepped out, they asked God to step in, and he did in a big way. Is that the only time he's ever done that? That way, yeah. But you know what? Let's see, there was a Jericho. That was an odd one, wasn't it? They followed what God said, and they celebrated, and they worshiped as they went around. And look what happened there. Um, think about Elijah on Mount Carmel. When Elijah celebrated God in front of the 400 prophets of Baal, and God's the one that sent the fire from heaven. Impossible situation. Think about David. He worshiped at Ziklag. David was out of town, out of Ziklag, and he was with all his warriors before he became king. And while they were out, a group came in and they burned the town and kidnapped all their wives and all their kids. And when David and his men came back, his men saw that and they said, we're going to kill David. They were going to stone David. And what did David do? He worshiped. He went to God and God said, you'll get him. Go after him. And they did. And think about Paul and Silas thrown in jail for doing the right thing. What did they do in jail? They sang. They worshiped. And what happened? The doors flew open and the chains fell off. Our God is able. So I ask you, where are you? Is there temptations and trials in your life right now? Is there something in your life, maybe it's a disease, that you can't conquer? You see, one of the things that I've learned from looking at this is when things are good, we praise God, don't we? When things are difficult, we pray to God. But here's one you may not have thought of. And this is the message I want you to get. When things are impossible, sing to God. Did you think of that? The war of worship, the surprise of worship, is that we say, God, I know you can do this, and then we praise him. So we're doing what we should do first, and then we praise God in the midst. That will lift your spirits, it'll put your confidence where it is, and invite God in because you are operating with faith. And it is impossible to please God without, anybody know? Without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith tickles him. What mountain are you facing? What giant are you facing? Do what you should do and then praise God. Sing aloud to him. For me, that's one of the things that happened in my sabbatical as the music came back. I found my day, my, myself one day when the house was empty, picked up a hymnal and just started singing some of the hymns. It sounded awful, but it felt so great. <laughs> and so this is what I want you to do. If you're in the midst of something that's not good, and we're facing some things even as a church, what's going to happen with, when the villages puts a wall up there um, that's going to inconvenience us for at least the construction period. After that, probably you'll be okay. I don't know. We haven't seen the plans yet. But maybe God is saying, I wonder if those folks really do believe in me. I think we should pray. I think we should go to God. There's other issues that we have to deal with. I think we should pray. I think we should go to God. Do the right thing and go to him. So stop looking around and let's look up. Let's not sulk, let's sing. Even for your personal things in your life, stop complaining and start co proclaiming. God, you are in charge of all of this. My future may look fuzzy from here, but one thing's for sure. I know you're in charge and this is the path you have me on. Again, stop telling God how big your problems are and start telling your problems how big your God is. For he is the light and darkness, isn't he? I would like a few amens after these statements. He is the light and the darkness. Amen? Amen. He is the way maker. Amen? Amen? He's the miracle worker. Amen? Amen. 
He's the promise keeper. Amen? That's the God that we worship. That's the God that laughs and scoffs at people trying to do things to you. You see, the problem is, even with Ahab, he thought, hey, you can fool some people all the time and you can fool some of the, you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time. But what he didn't know is if you're trying to fool God, you are the fool. Everybody will get theirs. Let's be faithful to God. Let's pray. Lord, there are issues in everybody's life here. Every one of us. And so, Lord, we lay that before you right now. We lay and lay before him whatever that is in your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's financial. But it's that mountain that you can't get over or through or around. Tell him about it. Lord, we don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. Now move, Lord. Move for your good. In Jesus' name, amen.